Beverly hat Chance. Das ist auch nicht so cool. Nee, wenn das ist so wie es haben wir.
Good morning to everyone and welcome to this uh, annual meeting of the Dynamic Coalition on Net Neutrality that this year will be on uh, 5G, IoT and zero rating challenges for uh, net neutrality. My name is Luca Belli, I am Professor of Internal Governance and Regulation at FGV Law School and I have the honor to chair this coalition. Uh, this year's program has been uh, uh, dedicated to these two main top, new topic, relatively new topic, that are emerging as uh, net neutrality uh, challenges. On the one hand, price discrimination, zero rating applications, so uh, sponsored applications that are not counted against the data caps of users. And on the other hand, the uh, emerging 5G technologies, which are also creating some net neutrality challenges. So uh, I would like, first of all, to introduce the panel. So we have from right to left, Aurore Tual uh, from Arcep, the French uh, regulator of telecommunications, um, Edison Lanza, the special rapporteur for freedom of expression of the Organization of American States, who will open our uh, debate, Frode Sorensen from ENCOM, the Norwegian regulator, K.S. Park uh, from the University of, uh, uh, South Korea, of Korea, sorry, no, in South Korea, uh, not in North Korea. And uh, we have uh, Thomas Loringen from Epicenter Work. And then last, but of course, not least, sorry, no, we have uh, Bob Frankston uh, from IEEE Consumer. Uh, Actually, I'm not speaking to them. I'm not speaking to them. I'm speaking to them. So, <laughs> Bob Frankston from IEEE, but he's not speaking on behalf of any IEEE things. And then last, but not least, Veronica Arroyo from Access Now. The first, uh, so we have a quite crowded panel uh, for these two very uh, relevant issues. We, are, you have, we have decided to structure this into two different segments right after the introduction uh, by Edison. Uh, the first one exploring why zero rating, so sponsored applications are having uh, some uh, positive sometimes, but also a lot of negative externalities on how people uh, enjoy internet access, uh, especially in developing countries where people do not have the money to uh, pay internet access fees and therefore they primarily access sponsored applications. And this has, of course, an impact not only on the fact that these applications become the main vector for information or disinformation uh, of people that, for instance, receive uh, fake news primarily through sponsored uh, social networks. It, on the other hand, it, be, it has also another very important negative externality, which is that uh, not only content is vehiculated primarily through sponsored applications, but data, personal data, are extracted primarily by those dominant, usually, applications. So this has, of course, uh, effects not only on the economy, it's more difficult for new entrants, for startups to enter the market if only the big uh, applications are sponsored and the others have to be paid, but also on democracies. If data, personal data of people are collected and centralized uh, only by few dominant applications, then those people can be profiled and uh, targeted content can be sent specifically to them on their mobile, which is, of course, the main uh, internet access venue nowadays, not only in, in developing countries, but also in developed countries. So these are uh, only part of the concerns we are going to discuss today before we uh, enter into the 5G debate. So without further ado, I would like to uh, uh, invite Edison to in introduce the uh, debate of today with his uh, keynote remarks. Please, Edison. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Luca, and the, the dynamic co coalition of net neutrality. It's a pleasure to, to be here and, and to, to make some introduced remarks. Uh, I'm in the special rapporteur of the freedom of expression in the Inter-American System of Human Rights that uh, have the, you know, the mandate around the uh, Occidental Hemisphere. But uh, uh, we have a, a common 
you know, approach with the human, the special rapporteur of uh, United Nations. And I think that uh, under the international law, uh, the, the, the principle of the net neutrality is an internet design principle. Uh, my, my office remarks in different re reports and different uh, statements that uh, net neutrality is a necessary condition for the exercise of freedom of expression and intersect with the guiding principles. The purpose of this principle is to ensure that the free access and user choice to use, send, receive, uh, or offer any lawful content, information, ideas, uh, and to choose application of uh, service through internet is not subject to condition or directed or restricted, uh, such as blocking, filtering, or uh, any interference. Uh, in, the, in our region, in Latin America, um, several countries uh, have already con uh, enacted an enforcement uh, and established the principle of net neutrality in their uh, framework, legal framework. Argentina, Brazil, Chile, Mexico, uh, and Paraguay, Ecuador uh, have uh, some disposition that uh, ensure and uh, oblige, uh, you know, the, the the service provider to respect freedom of expression and the you know the net neutrality in in the uh, manage of the data packet, uh, and also in 2015 uh, you know, we we has and we just, uh, you know. Um, uh, engage with the FCC policy on net neutrality that uh, in, in that moment was the most powerful in the region that uh, protect uh, and ban the practice of blocking or restricting uh, you know uh, the, what the people can do or see on, online, prevent uh, threatening, specifically prohibiting the degrading of traffic based on source, destination or content. Finally, uh, is pre preclude and, and, and also ban the, the paid priori priori prioritization. As you know, in, in 2017, the, the, uh, the current government in, in US and the, the, the current uh, commission of, uh, the Federal Commission of Communication uh, take down this, uh, this, this rule, this, this rule in, in US. Uh, but now there, is, there are, uh, you know, a fighting against this, uh, you know, this decision. Uh, as many states in, in, in US now pass uh, law to enforce then, you know, the, the, the principle like California, New York, New York and, and, and others. Uh, and it's now in, in, a, in a problematic situation, but I, I think it's, it's important to follow the uh, you know, the decisions uh, also in the U.S. Um, in, in respect to the, 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 the zero rating policies, uh, we released a, a, a special report about that uh, and, and acknowledge that the new and controversial debate arose in 2015 regarding these zero rating plans. Uh, that, you know, uh, allow internet service providers to provide access to a specific application without uh, that, that access being charged as expender in the end user data plan. Uh, and uh, if I say that uh, many countries uh, have, have and, and protect the, the, the net neutrality rule, also I, I want to say that in many cases in Latin America, there are an exemption to commercial plans. And uh, in fact, uh, you know, all of these countries, Mexico, uh, Ecuador, um, Brazil, uh, Argentina, uh, has um, allowed uh, the, you know, the, the practice of zero rating in, 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 in all of these countries. Uh, and in, in fact, uh, there is some researches about the civil society organization that, uh, you know, um, alert that the, the people in, in Latin America uh, do not have uh, the, the acknowledge to, to this thing uh, if they don't have access to, to the whole internet in, in some of the cases. Uh, the approach of the this zero rating plan is different. In, in some cases, it's, you know, a, a free, um, a free access 
uh, all the time to, to some uh, of this application. In other, in other, in other cases, it's uh, like a, a packet of data, and when the packet of data finish, uh, you know the people uh, want to and can uh, you know access to, to a restrict number of uh, application. Uh, finally, in, in, in regards of the, the impact of the externalities of these plans in, in Latin America, uh, I think that in, in, in one hand, uh, the, this, this kind of, uh, you know, application uh, could, you know, improve the access of people that don't have, you know, uh, the, 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 the level of, of money to, to, to access of this. Um, but in the other hand, we have a, a you know a, a huge problem with the universal access in, in, in similar condition for all the people in the region, and uh, you know in, in the uh, in the international law, uh, the, the, the states have the, the duty and the obligation to ensure the uh, uh, the whole access to internet for for all the people, and this kind of plan don't you know. Uh, substitute the, 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 this obligation by, by the states. Um, finally, I want to say that in, in the context of this polarization, um, uh, you know, political uh, polarization environment in Latin America, uh, we acknowledge that uh, in some cases, like Brazil, uh, this kind of plan uh, has a, a very uh, problematic uh, impact in, in democracy and in the access of information in, in the context of, in the electoral context. Uh, why? Because uh, in, in, in many cases, uh, WhatsApp, Facebook, and this kind of application is the only one application that the million of people access in, 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 in the context of, uh, you know, electoral or, or another context. And uh, when fake news, disinformation, misinformation flow uh, through these platforms, uh, this, uh, you know, population don't have the, the possibility to check out uh, with other uh, information or other sources the information that flow through these, uh, these platforms. Uh, and. You know, for health case, climate change, and, and other issues, this is a, a, a huge problem that we start to look in in, in, in Latin America, and no one is, is, is very useful to to know what experience have in the other region of the of, of the global. Thank you very much, uh, Edison, also for highlighting that uh, this actually in the, in the Americas, in especially in Latin America, this. Uh, plans are existing, are allowed uh, in, in spite of the existence of net neutrality policies. So it is a uh, choice, explicit choice of the regulators in those countries to allow uh, this kind of plans based on the calculation maybe that is better to have uh, a little bit of internet than not having it. But probably this uh, is also based on a miscalculation that uh, when you have a, a little bit of internet, that little bit becomes much more uh, easier to manipulate and to be used to extract uh, very useful information and personal data from those countries. And this may have a nefarious also impact on democracies besides the uh, the uh, economic impact on, on competition. Uh, before we uh, start the first segment, I would also like to clarify that, unfortunately, we do not have any uh, representative from the telecom sector today. Uh, I have invited four, uh, but none of them, unfortunately, could participate. Uh, but uh, I'm sure there will be uh, some representative from the telecom sector in the room, so whenever they want, they are absolutely invited to uh, provide their feedback and input and uh, help us having a uh, more constructive discussion. So uh, now, hope opening the first segment on zero rating, uh, I would like to ask, uh, uh, Thomas to provide some insights based on the study they have been uh, developing. He has also a presentation. While the presentation of Thomas is uh, uh, put on screen, I would also like to uh, invite you to uh, check the, our annual outcome of the coalition, which is the website uh, zerorating.info to provide you 
information on the rating, as you may guess from the URL. And uh, it consolidates, basically, a lot of uh, resources on zero rating, plus a zero rating map uh, that provides you information on which kind of applications are sponsored around the world and which kind of policy, net neutrality or zero rating policy, um, exists around the world. So this is a, a free-to-use resource that you may access and share as you want and hopefully that also regulators will use to, uh, to uh, have more informed policy, which is our uh, final goal. Uh, is the, the presentation of Thomas already ready? Excellent. So Thomas, please go ahead. Okay. Wonderful. Okay. Um, what I'm going to do now is to briefly explain where we are right now, but first I should also introduce, um, I'm speaking here on behalf of Epicenter Works, it's a Vienna-based digital rights organization, and I'm also chair of the um, Net Neutrality Working Group in European Digital Rights, the umbrella organization of over 40 digital rights organizations in the European Union. And uh, most of my examples are from the EU, um, but I think some of the conclusions could apply globally. Um, uh, last year in Paris, I showed you this slide, uh, which were the preliminary results of a study that we did, uh, in which we um, basically analyzed and looked for all of the zero rating offers in the European Union and the European Economic Area. So uh, basically all of the countries where the existing net neutrality framework in Euro Europe applies to, and you can see that uh, five of the top ten applications are from one company, from Facebook, and only three applications in the top 20 are based out of the European economic area. Um, and um, if uh, you then, uh, another analysis that we did, uh, you can see here, um, so we basically looked at all of the zero rating offers in all of these countries. We could identify 186 uh, separate offers. The whole data set as well as the report is available under a free license on our website, uh, apcenter.works. And here we analyzed the um, um, geographical relationship between the ISP and uh, the headquarter of the provider of that application uh, service. And you could see that in the normal type of zero rating application, zero rating program, where the ISP is choosing the applications that participate, we have a strong tendency towards US-based dominant uh, applications profiting from zero rating. Um, but there is also a new type of zero rating offer. Binjan from T-Mobile in the US was the first, and uh, many more of these open programs uh, and can now also be found in the European Union. Um, they distinguish themselves uh, by allowing some form of sign up for interested CUPS, for interested application providers to join the zero rating program. And if you only look at uh, these, you come to the um, picture that there is actually a strong uh, benefit for local applications. And then in second place, you still have applications with a headquarter in the USA. Um, and then particularly from a European perspective, the cross-border provisioning of applications actually drastically goes down. Um, and uh, we then further dived into uh, that data set and analyzed how many of these zero rating deals can an application actually sustain? And we found that the majority of applications only can sustain uh, between one and three of these deals with uh, a telecom company. And um, that, of course, is because there is um, first an administrative burden. You, get, uh, you need to know about the program. You need to sign up for it. You need to enter into commercial agreements that often also come with a liability for wrongfully built data volume. And you have to supply identification criteria to the telecom company to make your service distinguishable in the network of that ISP from other traffic so that it can be built differently. And basically, every application has to enter into a contract with every ISP whose customer it might want to reach or um, serve a competitive offer. Um, and the um, peak there at the end between 31 and 52 commercial agreements, um, that is, again, the top 20. Um, so that whole study is available online under this URL, and uh, you can read it. It was released this January, and it is also our contribution to the ongoing net neutrality reform in the European <coughs> Union. 
Um, but I think we also want to talk about 5G, and so I also brought a little bit of um, basic examples on, on the new mobile network generation standard. Um, and uh, first, it is really important to stress that 5G is not a revolution, but an evolution. Uh, so like previous mobile um, network standards, uh, it is not drastically changing uh, everything. Um, one particular technology aspect that we have to be cautious about is network slicing. And as the name suggests, you're slicing up the network into uh, low latency, high bandwidth, or low energy consumption slice. And there are particularly use cases that uh, the industry is putting forward in order to uh, justify uh, why 5G is so drastically different. Um, one is uh, self-driving cars. Um, the, it's often said that they rely on a 5G network in order to even function. Uh, we dispute that because uh, then these self-driving cars could not go uh, to rural Brandenburg here uh, outside of Berlin or to a tunnel or a mountainous area. And that's also why uh, the European Commission recently backed a Wi-Fi based standard for car-to-car -car based communication. It's basically um, a mesh network. And if you then look at the statements of the consortium that backed the 5G standard, I actually find it quite fuzzy, uh, funny that uh, they are um, complaining about discriminatory interoperability and compatibility requirements. Another example that you hear a lot about is connected farms. Um, and there again, I would really dispute the basic premise uh, because rural areas right now have the worst mobile coverage in most countries and uh, also the, the um, least amount of people living there, so it would uh, probably be economically unwise to really invest in these areas, although it would be very beneficial for the people living there. And investing in the most modern and most expensive network technology, of course, um, can, should be questioned. Another example is Industry 4.0, uh, connecting facilities. And again, here I'm going to bring an example of Europe. Uh, the, uh, German Association of um, Chemical Industries actually applauded the German regulator Bundesnetzagentur about their decision to uh, hand out part of the 5G spectrum for independent use. So if you operate a factory in Germany, you can just apply with the regulators and get that spectrum for your specific location and build your own 5G network. The chemical industry in Germany is very happy about that move and it justifies this with the confidentiality and integrity of their data. Lastly, um, remote surgery over 5G, that's actually a real example from China. Um, and uh, to even bring this up is kind of missing the point because you would never run remote surgery over the open internet. Um, the open internet is just not capable of delivering the levels of assured quality um, and so you would go for a specialized service for that and keep it as far away from the open internet as possible. Um, finally, um, there is a case to make in some extent about online multiplayer virtual reality games because there is a low latency slice but I'm happy to discuss this. This is also a discussion that should be really technical. Um, and I just want to um, debunk this a little bit with the numbers of the telecom industry. This is GSMA, the Global Association of Telecom um, Operators. And uh, even their most optimistic projection foresees only a 14% share of 5G mobile connections uh, by 2025. So the market share of such gaming consoles um, is quite small. And lastly, the example of uh, Internet of Things, IoT. Um, and yeah, here I would also really caution uh, the type of, of um, yeah, economic incentive and, and, and uh, ecosystem that we create. Um, because if a certain type of device really relies on a specific type of network slice connectivity, then you end up with this. Instead of a universal a connection that is the neutral internet right now, or a universal power plug, uh, country specific of course, you end up with very application specific access technologies and I don't think that uh, this is uh, from a sustainable perspective uh, the right choice to make. And because I'm over time, I will leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Thomas, also to provide some very useful uh, uh, inputs for the next segment on uh, 5G. Uh, now, uh, I would like to ask to KS Park to provide also some uh, inputs on uh, what are the most recent uh, developments of the net neutrality debate in South Korea. South Korea is uh, actually uh, one of the few 
uh, I would say two, uh, maybe three, one may say, countries that is also massively investing in 5G. Uh, but it is uh, a country where a lot of uh, issues that uh, we have been discussing uh, over the past years uh, about uh, traffic discrimination uh, or uh, prioritization or uh, any kind of uh, uh, commercial uh, agreement between different vertically integrated uh, uh, actors is becoming much more visible uh, in the over the past couple of years. So, KS, uh, please go ahead and provide us some uh, uh, insight on the South uh, Korean debate. Uh, uh, thank you. Um, I, I think we should first establish that um, we love internet because it um, makes uh, it makes this project uh, it makes this project uh, scalable. Uh, the project of uh, letting everyone, even powerless individuals, to become the uh, actors in mass communication, where people can connect with one another uh, without the. Uh, without receiving approval of uh, gatekeepers like uh, newspaper or television. Uh, having said that, uh, network neutrality uh, is uh, uh, crucial to maintaining uh, that significance of the uh, internet. Um, I think it was a mistake for Tim Wu, who coined the term network neutrality, to use public utility or other common carriers like gas or electricity to promote his idea of uh, um, network neutrality as a non-discrimination principle uh, because gas, electricity, these are all subject to usage-based pricing uh, where people pay for what they use. Now, in the internet, uh, there is no provider of any services. There is no receiver of services. Uh, the idea behind the internet uh, is that the idea behind the internet is not to create a gatekeeper, not even a reasonable gatekeeper, so that all the computers can talk to one another without actually connecting with one another. Um, now, setting it up as a non-discrimination principle leaves open the possibility of allowing reasonable discrimination. Now, there is no such thing as reasonable discrimination on the internet. Uh, the internet is basically a promise, a promise that all the computers will receive packets from one neighbor, pass on to another neighbor that is closer to the uh, destination, that is marked on the uh, data packet, free of charge, free of any non-financial condition. Now, if that's the internet, that means all the computers are participating in the delivery of, uh, delivery of data for all other uh, computers. So I think that network neutrality should be reestablished as a principle that there will be no financial or non-financial condition for, uh, delivering the, uh, for delivery of uh, data packets. Now, this is not my invention. Um, if you look at the uh, economic, uh, uh, if you look at economics literature, the way the economists define network neutrality is that termination fee is equal to zero, which means there should be no money demanded or any other condition that the uh, uh, data packet uh, uh, that the data packet constitutes certain content or type of content uh, in delivery of uh, data. Um, so, why am I talking about this? Well, if you look at Korea, uh, I mean the 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 idea the idea that you pay for what you use, this is so hard to shake off people's thinking. So uh, in Korea, if you look at the uh, uh, Korean network neutrality guideline, it allows 
reasonable discrimination of data packets, which means that whenever, um, M, uh, whenever mobile uh, voice over IP packets are throttled or blocked by uh, local telcos who want to protect their uh, voice revenue, uh, you know, normal, normal uh, over uh, normal telephone uh, normal telephone calls. Um, whoever is making an argument against that has to bring has to do all this economic analysis to somehow uh, win over to prevail over the telco's argument that oh you know they need to protect their uh, uh, voice revenue to be able to invest in network building. Um, so, so plaintiffs have the burden of proof when, uh, they, uh, when they could not use the, uh, uh, the, the access they, they purchased for the use that they want to uh, make of. Uh, and another aspect of a network neutrality guideline is that it more freely allows network slicing uh, that Thomas uh, talked about, because uh, the way it is phrased, uh, as long as the minimum quality of a general internet is protected, the telcos can use the surplus bandwidth for whatever purpose they can make use of uh, for self-driving cars, they can slice up the bandwidth and sell each slice at a, a higher price as long as the minimum quality of uh, internet uh, is uh, uh, protected for uh, ordinary uh, consumers. And this, I mean, uh, this, this loophole in the guideline, again, comes from this idea uh, that there, is, uh, there has to be payment for delivery of a package. So I wanted to talk about Korea, but also wanted to kind of uh, pick your brain about uh, how to reestablish network neutrality uh, you know, from the fundamentals of the internet uh, so that it becomes a better functioning norm on the discussion on uh, uh, 5G network slicing and when I have more time, I'll talk about uh, usage-based pricing uh, that has become another um, uh, really restrictive norm in Korea. Um, again, uh, when I have time, I, I, I'll go into that. Thank, Thank you, you very much, KS, for, for, for respecting uh, your timing. Uh, the, the, indeed, you raise some very relevant issues, uh, which is the fact that in many uh, in many countries, although there, are, there has al already been elaboration of uh, net neutrality guidelines policy, uh, we actually see that there is a divergence between what is in the policy and the implementation in the practice. And also, we see that many of the issues that we uh, took for granted, the fundamentals of net neutrality, like uh, no discrimination based on commercial agreements, are actually, actually not really uh, so uh, uh, respected or so shared even when they are uh, included within uh, national policies. Uh, now, to conclude this first segment, I would like to ask to uh, Veronica Arroyo from Access to provide uh, some uh, elements, also to uh, have a better idea of what also Edison was mentioning before about the, the wide share adoption of zero rating practices in, the, in Latin America and how this is having a concrete impact on Latin American uh, societies. So please, Veronica. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Does it sound? Yeah. Okay. First of all, thank you very much for this invitation. For us, it's quite important to be here in this dynamic uh, coalition session on net neutrality. As you know, Axel now has been fighting, trying to promote um, net neutrality principle in every space. Uh, today, I want to take some time uh, of my speech to talk about um, like two initiatives and that are happening in my home country. I'm from Peru, and I want to talk about that. We have a net neutrality regulation there. However, um, you, might, you might remember free basics, right? Free basics, 
every, we talked about that for <laughs> many time, many years. But no, nowadays, Facebook is trying to relaunch FreeBasics 2.0, which is a new generation of FreeBasics, which is exactly going to be like a browser. They sell it as a browser. So the user uh, is going to download this application, and through this application, uh, they will access to free content. All the internet will be free. Uh, they will not have access to videos nor um, images because you know that that's that costs. And they are they're already this is being implemented in Peru and in Colombia, and they are going to spread this in the next months, but they are trying to relaunch this, I don't know exactly when, but we've been, we've been having conversations with Facebook regarding this, this point. Um, first of all, we have to say that uh, this new um, type of, this new generation of free basics uh, kind of listened to our claims when we were discussing the first um, free basics. Which was we at that time we criticized as the violation of the net neutrality principle. We criticized as the insecurity of the of the um, of the initiative, also its position as a global gatekeeper of, for, for internet and connectivity. However, nowadays uh, with this new episode of Free Basics 2.0, which is there and people can use it now <laughs> in this moment, and they have very uh, not much uh, users right now, but I. I think they are expecting to increase the quantity of users, but we we want to raise some flags here. Uh, first of all, the, there is a lack of information of how it works. So uh, today it works, at, at least in Peru, it works with two ISPs. One is Entel and the other one is Vitel, a Vietnamese uh, company. And there is no information how this works. There is no information to the user, but it's available. That, so the user can download the app right now and they can start using this. There is no information uh, regarding the quantity of data, uh, free data they have every single day. There is no way they can check uh, how much data is left. Um, there, there, there is no information if the ISP or Facebook can check track the, the traffic or how they are doing this. Question. We hope and we expect uh, Facebook is going to release more information soon when they, when they relaunch this application. Um, also, there are problems on security because we, we, we already asked Facebook for the specifications so to, so, to get a look on how this exactly is working um, because we don't know exactly how Facebook is managing the, the traffic using this uh, browser. Again, I'm trying to use this because I don't know exactly how to explain it, but it, they sell it as a browser. Uh, what happens if the, if the user wants to use this browser for banking operations is the entire free basics 2.0 encrypted or not we don't know uh, we don't know exactly if um, they they can they can as they're going to be like the door to the internet if they're going to discriminate or give us uh, some preferences to one service to, to other service we don't know exactly that also I, I do believe that this creates a perversive incentive as um, when we, were t when we were talking with Facebook about this, they show us that among the most popular services that users um, access through this browser, they have YouTube, Facebook, and Instagram. As you know, the experience of the users in these platforms is mainly uh, videos and photos. That's exactly what you do in Instagram, right? And then if Freebase 6 2.0 does not allow you to watch uh, videos or photos, so then how how is the user loving these applications using Free Basics 2.0? We don't know how is that happening, but what we see is that they are giving this free sample of internet, which is a really bad sample because it doesn't allow you to see videos and photos, but then you increase the desire of the user to watch that, those things and they start to buy data because they have to use their data in order to watch those things. And then this is really good for the ISP because then you get more users and then you get more, you can sell more data. Um, another um, worry that I have here is that if they are selling this as a, like a browser idea, um, isn't this something to worry regarding vertical concentration maybe because they have this, they are in many layers of the internet but now they're trying to be there also in the browser um, market. And when I see this, um, this thing happening in my country, at, at the same time I see things like this happening. 
Um, this is like an ad of the Vietnamese national company, uh, which operates mainly in remote cities where just you can access to 2G, 3G internet. Um, they have, this is a plan or a program. They have zero rating. Those are the applications because even though we have a regulation for net neutrality, we do accept zero rating when uh, there is no preferences among the competitors the service that compete among each other. And, but this thing is that uh, they give you, with less than $2, they give you uh, 1.5 gigas for internet, apart from the zero rating. When you are done with your, uh, your 1.5 gigas, you have access to free data. The, uh, and, and, and it's illimited, so it's, it has, it's limited here. And you can read the, specific, the specs here. The only thing is that the speed gets lower. And, but you have free access to everything. So you have these initiatives, this kind of initiatives happening, and at the same time we have Free Basics 2.0 that is trying to sell this whole new concept of internet without images and without uh, videos. So this is something to worry about. I just want to put this on the table because this can come up soon. Uh, we are still waiting for um, Facebook to be more open, and I think they, they will do this when they relaunch this application, but this is something that there is still there, so people are accessing to this thing there, in that's Peru and Colombia. Yeah, that's it. Thank you very much, and uh, before opening for the first round of comments and uh, questions, uh, I think one uh, very important point has to be highlighted, which is uh, the fact that we usually consider zero rating only as from the perspective of the recipient, of the customer that receives something free, a gift, a, a free uh, content, free video, free. But it is the, question, the, the, the great questions that one has to ask, and I hope government and regulator will ask, uh, as everyone, unless we have li been living in a cave for the past 10 years, now know that data are the most valuable resource in the world, it is, is this really free? Meaning, th everyone knows there is not such a thing as a free lunch. So if you receive something free from a for-profit corporation, it's quite hard to believe that this is completely free and it is not paid with personal data. And if personal data is the most strategic and valuable asset we have nowadays, is it wise to give uh, open access to national strategic resources to uh, dominant and usually foreign corporations that have demonstrated over the past five, ten years that are not uh, the most careful uh, corporations that to uh, be trusted with people's data. That is just a provocation that I, um, I'm dropping there, start hoping that uh, this will uh, spark provocative comments and questions in this first round of, uh, of uh, comments and questions. So if you have any, uh, there are uh, mics there that we can, you can use to uh, add your comments or uh, ask your questions. So please, if anyone has any comments or questions about this first segment, uh, go ahead. The uh, mics are there for you. Don't be shy. Yes, uh, I, I hope you could just uh, uh, take the mic yourself because we don't have anyone helping with mics in this moment. So if you can use that mic. Thank you very much. Oh, hello. My name is Abdul Mohsen Shiha. I'm a PhD student in telecommunications law at the University of Strasbourg. So um, I, just, I just would like to get back to the Peruvian example. It was very interesting what you were talking about and uh, I want to know exactly what are the concerns of this discrimination in connectivity. Is it about distortions, distortions in competition between the companies or is it a social concern about the connectivity of end users? Thank you. Uh, yes, we have other questions, and then it's better if we take two or three, and then we get back to the panel. Yeah. Hi, my name is Alfredo Velasco. I'm from Ecuador. In the same line of uh, Veronica Arroyo said about the the zero rating applications, uh, in Latin America we have uh, unlimited but limited 
uh, functions about APP. Uh, no, it's uh, unlimited WhatsApp. We have only some functions about WhatsApp are, are free. Uh, in the European case, it's the same. Uh, we have uh, some functions restricted or uh, there are real un unlimited. Thank you. Okay, I think we can get back to the panel unless there is uh, any other comments in this moment. Okay. Do you have a comment there? No. So, yeah, please. If anyone wants to take this, maybe either if the Veronica wants to start or, uh, yes, Edison. Edison, please go ahead. I think, uh, thank you for the comments. And I think that the, the, the big problem in, in Latin America is that the, the regulator that they have the capacity to uh, monitoring and uh, measure these kind of uh, plans uh, do not have any, any uh, you know, um, control about that. that no? And uh, in, 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 the, in the report that I mentioned, um, I say that the, the state uh, uh, need to assist in the, the compatibility of the policies with the term of the rules of the government and the regulator of the net neutrality uh, and, and, and establish a, a test with a human right, uh, you know, impact in, in, in this case. Uh, because, well, uh, in, 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 in some hand, I, I think that it's positive to, to, to try to, to improve the, the access of in a region with a, a, a very, very high, you know, inequality. But in the other hand, um, you know, it's a duty of the, the state to, to have a measure and, and, and monitoring the impact in human rights in regard to privacy, freedom of expression, uh, social impact, and, and democracy impact, no? And I, I think that, uh, you know, I, I don't know any regulator that uh, released some report or some information about the, the you know, the, the impact and the monitoring of this, this kind of plans. Veronica, yeah. Yeah, regarding the question on, okay, we are worried about, yeah, we are worried about, the, we can always be worried about competition. There is concentration happening in, in, in telecom industries that's quite normal normal again because we are not expecting to have that but okay but also the, our our worry is more um, related to our rights and that's why I, I was a uh, the first things that I emphasized was regarding like the lack of information that we have right now to exactly know how this new um, free basics 2.0 works because we are worried about the security of the of the of the application we're worried about how the data is being processed how the trafficking is happening uh, and everything, we, we, if, this going, if this is going to be something that uh, will be available for everyone, because nowadays um, they, this is just available in two ISPs, but they are working, and they, they are open to work with other ISPs as well. So at some point that can be open for everyone and available to everyone. Um, so our, our, our concerns are that, I don't exactly if I'm answering your question, um, but I can go deep on that, on those points later after the session, yeah. Uh, there's also Thomas and uh, KS that want to add something. M I may just interject to also uh, take advantage of my moderator role to abuse of it and say also something about the fact that uh, the question actually, if the concerns are more about de democracy or economy, is, mis is a misleading one. Because we should start understanding that concerns on democracy and economy are intimately intertwined. If you not, do not have competition, it means that you don't have startups in your country generating revenues, work, and it means that those people that are unemployed and that are, that are also only used to generate personal data that is exported abroad, at some point will be furious and will vote any kind of clown that tells them that uh, is going to restore uh, order and the uh, prosperity, of course, lying. And the two things are intimately intertwined. The fact that uh, lack of competition is a threat for democracy. Because if you have less entrance in the market, if you have less business, you have less jobs and you have more furious people. So for social stability purpose, I would not suggest to any government or regulator to reduce competition because people that do not have jobs and work 
still vote. And, then, and so that, that means that at the next election, they will have to meet them and they will be furious. Yeah, I, I think um, it's astonishing how much we are all agreeing here on this panel, but I want to also add to that last point. Of course, um, you could also look at the, the question on the cost of uh, zero rating as the cost of innovation, um, because you actually increase the entry barriers to, to um, any country where you have um, zero rating, and particularly if you try to extend your service beyond just one country or one region, um, <clears throat> if you really try to challenge incumbent players, um, you will find that these zero rating programs, no matter how open or non-discriminatory they are, will become an obstacle to grow. And uh, this can also be seen um, by the statements of, uh, for example, Netflix, uh, when it was obvious that the US will roll back their regulation. Actually, um, the CEO of Netflix said that um, shareholders shouldn't worry because Netflix is now big enough to survive even in a climate without net neutrality. So in a way, every country that does not have very dominant internet platforms should be in favor of abolishing zero rating and also abolishing data caps. And lastly, there is another argument in terms of costs is the privacy cost, uh, because in order to um, provision these types of services, what telecom companies often have to resort to is deep packet inspection, um, to actually look quite deep to um, the, the SNIs or so the host names or the URLs of every data package in order to um, count and build them differently. Um, and, and another question was asked by this gentleman about um, the fact that most of these zero rating programs only um, apply to certain functionalities. So, for example, WhatsApp is often zero rated, but uh, often does not include um, uh, WhatsApp audio or video calls or video messages. Um, and uh, you can actually see quite arbitrary distinctions uh, that are often not transparent to the consumer um, which uh, functionalities of which application are actually um, a part of the zero rating and not. Um, if you also research the support forums of many of these programs, you'll find many customers actually being angry and are not understanding their bill anymore. Um, and if you think about it, I mean, in fact, the URL of every data package will become billing data at one point mm -hmm. um, because these um, uh, billing mechanisms are quite fine granular. And again, they are um, um, bad for innovation because if you create a multifunctionality app, for example, Wire Messenger, that also, it is a messenger, but it's also a groupware and a file sharing software, in which part of the zero rating uh, bucket should it fit? So it's actually a quite arbitrary distinction that tries to chop up the internet into individual pieces and then sell them separately, which is just not the way this, this technology was meant to be exercised. Uh, KS. I, I think that uh, the main concern with the uh, uh, selective zero rating uh, is um, the dest uh, destruction of competition uh, between different contents. Number one, uh, telco in Korea, both in wired internet and wireless internet, is SK Telecom. SK Telecom uh, began online shopping mall uh, and zero, uh, zero rated uh, their own shopping mall, but no other shopping mall. Uh, SK Telecom never had experience in online shopping mall, but once they began doing that, uh, that online shopping mall you know how tough competition is between different shopping malls in any country. Uh, SK Telecom's affiliate shopping mall became number two uh, and still uh, has maintained that status. Um, there was a research on how many people are willing to change their telco uh, to use online shopping mall uh, free of uh, uh, data caps, uh, opening 65% said they are willing to change their telco to use zero-rated online shopping mall. That shows how much, um, uh, how much uh, lack of competition or how much disruption of competition can result from zero-rating. Now, having said that, let me say something controversial about zero-rating. Uh, the pre-Trump FCC of the United States uh, under Thomas Wheeler, uh, did the uh, antitrust analysis of uh, different zero ratings. Uh, the paper, although it was never officially published as a, a statement of FCC, uh, said that 
zero rating, uh, uh, telco zero rating their own contents uh, is uh, uh, heavily presumed to be uh, uh, anti-competitive, but zero rating the independent contents uh, is not. So T-Mobile zero rating, uh, was it Netflix? Uh, I, I, I forgot what the content was, but that was considered not anti-competitive. Now, I think that there is some lesson there in line with what I said before. The internet is born free. The internet, you don't purchase data, you purchase access. Uh, so zero rating, I mean, the internet is supposed to be zero ready to be born with. Now, when things became mobile, because you cannot predict how many people will be using uh, certain access points, K we KS, began, may, may yes, let, 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 let me just finish. Uh, we, we, we began applying data caps, but data caps are not supposed to be there to begin with. Um, and with the new 5G technology, uh, maybe we can even get rid of data caps on mobile as well. So if zero rating allows, I mean, if, if some of the zero rating programs allows to use internet without data caps, the more the better. Think about that. Now, sorry, Bob, I see that you are boiling, but we really, I mean, to, to stick to the program, very short sentence, please. All the zero rating is, is about symptoms. The fundamental concept of telecommunication from 1870 or even 1830 is the problem. And arguing over zero rating is arguing over minor symptoms on the side, and we have to get to the real dysfunctionality. I'll get to my talk. And as also KS was mentioning 5G, it provides us a good segue to start the second segment of this section with our uh, actual that is going to tell us uh, a little bit more about how RCEP uh, is approaching uh, zero rating, well, not really zero rating, but in, not only zero rating, but uh, net neutrality violations, and then a little bit more on how they are approaching 5G. Thank you, Aurora. Oh, yeah, can we have Aurora's presentation? And also, I would also like to thank uh, Vivian Vinagre, that is our uh, uh, remote moderator. And if there is any comment or question from the net, please tell us so that we can address it. First, thanks uh, a lot for the invitation. So I'm Aurora Chal from uh, RCEP. RCEP is a French regulatory authority for electronic communications, postal and print media distribution. It's the architect and guardian of the country's network, internet, fixed and mobile telecoms, and postal networks. The authority works to ensure that those networks develop as a common good. Regarding net neutrality, RCEP has a dedicated team and uses different tools to establish a diagnosis of the compliance with the European Open Internet uh, Regulation. So firstly, monitoring terms and conditions, press review, but also social media. Analyzing user reports through a platform called Jalert Larcep. Discussion within the BEREC uh, with other regulatory authorities are also helpful. For instance, regarding the rating. Proactive dialogue when identifying potential restriction uh, to net neutrality um, is also used. For instance, last year, fo RCEP focused on freedom of choice and device use in the ISP's mobile plans. After RCEP took action, operators removed the clauses that limited the use of SIM cards and the use of tethering. RCEP also made available uh, an application called WE. It was developed by the Northeastern uh, University and can be accessed by any consumer through an Android or iOS application. So the testing tool compares the time it takes, it takes for traffic generating by certain services uh, to be relayed. It measures the difference between the traffic stream actual travel time through the network layers and the travel time for a similar but encrypted traffic stream. If the results for a given source are significantly different in a similar and matching fashion, 
then it is possible to suspect that the operator has implemented measures that affect traffic. User can then decide to inform RCEP, which will be in position to investigate those reports. So this new distributed tool is part of RCEP crowdsourcing initiatives that are designed to empower consumer, making each and everyone an integral participant in the regulatory process. So the partnership between the Northeastern University and RCEP is still going on, so as to adapt the services tested to the most used one in France, and to develop a new fun functionality for testing prioritizing of ports. In France, more than 62,000 tests have been realized so far. As yet, none of the results provided by the application have made it possible to suspect any traffic management practices that violate net neutrality rules in France. And finally, according to European and national legislation, RCEP published every year a report on the state of the internet in France, and the summary is available. I have a few ones here if you're interested. So um, we are very happy to continue discussion on net neutrality, and in particular on net neutrality and 5G. So regarding 5G, RCEP is in line with the Berec position, which concludes that the open internet regulation is technology neutral and therefore applies without consequences to 5G technology. It notes that the, the regulation seems to be leaving considerable room for the implementation of 5G technologies, and it is not aware of any concrete example where the implementation uh, would be impeded by the regulation. So, based on this statement, RCEP is involved with the stakeholders to understand the new use cases um, allowed by 5G technologies and the stakeholder needs. <coughs> to this end, France launched a 5G pilot window for market players in two frequency bands. So the first one is the 3.4 to 3.8 gigahertz band. More than 70 experimentation were carried out and most of them led by telecom industry players, but also by academics. And the other one is a 26 gigahertz band, where 12 projects have been authorized, including several projects led by verticals or consortia that do not specialize in telecommunication. So the objectives of those pilots are to unify all the players along the value chain, and to allow them testing out business models, allocating frequencies to interested players to conduct the first 5G trials, and obtaining uh, initial feedbacks from the stakeholder. Just two quick example, concrete example of the ongoing uh, experimentation in the 26 gigahertz bands. The first one is um, at a national velodrome in France. So the goal is to improve video recording of cycle races with use cases that ranges from augmented reality replay of the different events to application enabled by progress in fixed and mobile audio and video equipment in sports media. So this open trial platform could raise the challenges facing the future Olympic Games site. The second example is the port of Le Havre. So the goal is to explore and test 5G application in a port and an industry-related context. This includes application in the field of energy, so, such as uh, operating small grids or recharging electric vehicles. Other applications will focus, will focus more on logistical operation in the port area, like operating container terminals. In the ongoing experimentation, no question regarding neutrality have been identified so far, but RSM remains attentive and open to discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Earl, and also thank you for providing a very good example of uh, what my friend Chris Marston was saying since years, which is that regulators should partner with Geek in order to have creative solutions to solve problems, and actually we see that the results are quite uh, impressive uh, when this partnership happens. Uh, so to have some other ideas of how uh, regulators are acting and also how they are tackling 5G 
uh, issues, the balance between 5G and net neutrality policy, and what are really the 5G concrete uh, examples and evolutions that we can witness, I would like to ask to throw this on and to provide us a little bit of uh, uh, information about uh, what uh, ANCOM is doing and also the BEREC works and also which are the, the concrete examples that you are seeing in your work as a regulator. Thank you very much, Luca. Is the mic on? Thank you. Um, in my intervention, I will uh, discuss the compatibility between net neutrality and 5G. And the, the intervention from ASEP was a, a good start-up to my presentation. I, I will go a little bit deeper into uh, the 5G use cases. And, and um, as a net neutrality regulation example, I, I will necessarily use the, the Norwegian and European approach to, to net neutrality, but I expect uh, it to be applicable to, to net neutrality in, in general as well. If you look at the 5G networks uh, as they are, are marketed by, by uh, operators and their organizations, they foresee three main use cases. It's, it's often drawn as a triangle where you have uh, the enhanced mobile broadband in one of the corners, uh, which means high-speed internet access, simply. Uh, and then you have the low-latency communications, real-time communication in the second corner. And then you have the massive machine-to-machine -machine communications in the third corner. So I will start to discuss uh, internet access services compared to these um, quality of service based services. Um, there is a major misunderstanding regarding how net neutrality regulation works. It, it seems like the, there is a, an understanding that net neutrality means that you can't have good quality of service. And, and that's not the case. In, in the European regulation, of course, we foresee a good speed on the access to the internet itself. But there is also a possibility to provide other services than internet access services. These services are often referred to as specialized services in, in European regulation. Then the question is, when can you provide a service as a specialized service instead of an internet application? So what the European regulation foresees is that if a service needs quality of service and it cannot be provided of the in, over the internet access, then it is still allowed to be provided separately as a specialized service. So therefore, uh, these uh, low latency services that we foresee in the 5G networks is fully compatible with the European net neutrality regulation. And more than that, it actually facilitates this use case because um, when you have the, the 5G networks fully developed, you, you will have this uh, network slicing functionality, which was already uh, touched by Thomas in his presentation. So these um, network slicing function actually helps to provide specialized services in a way that is compatible with the European regulation, because there is a requirement that the internet access service is not degraded, that the general quality of this service should be kept up to speed uh, when the specialized services are provided in parallel. So therefore, we believe that 5G will actually be easier to implement than 4G under the European net neutrality regulation. Secondly, uh, regarding Internet of Things, which is in the third corner of, of uh, this triangle, um, what is Internet of Things? What is machine-to-machine -machine communication? It's actually just an application. It's an application running on a separate piece of hardware. So uh, the goal of achieving um, innovation of services, innovation of applications, is also apl applicable, of course, to in Internet of Things, which is a kind of application which is running on its own uh, hardware equipment. How can that be um, um, compatible with the European net neutrality regulation? Um, there, there you have a, a separate misunderstanding that is uh, also uh, 
disturbing the discussion about this compatibility because uh, net neutrality regulation does not regulate any communication in the world. It doesn't communicate, it doesn't regulate all of the communications uh, we have because there are also uh, private uh, communication networks. For example, a corporate network is not regulated uh, by net neutrality. Uh, the regulation is, is uh, provided for public services. So if you have a private service, it's not regulated. And uh, you can also foresee that machine-to-machine uh, -machine communication could be provided as a private uh, network running in parallel to, to the internet. And of course, also, Internet of Things could uh, enjoy these uh, quality of service uh, architecture provided as a specialized service in parallel to the internet access. So thereby, the, the conclusion is that these three separate service categories foreseen in the 5G should be compatible with the European net neutrality regulation. We have also had discussions in, in uh, Norway with the different operators and, and Barak also at the European level has had discussions in workshops and also had public consultations uh, where we have explicitly requested for specific use cases in the 5G that should uh, could be a problem uh, under the European regulation and we are still waiting for examples, uh, concrete examples that are not compatible. These are not provided so far, so um, based on my general presentation uh, uh, it, it explains uh, in, in, in the broader lines how this is uh, foreseen to be compatible with uh, net neutrality. So 5G is, is highly welcome, of course, and regulators are uh, paving the way for, for this so, so uh, to facilitate uh, achievements of 5G developments uh, in the different countries. That is also a goal we have as a regulator. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Frode. Uh, and uh, actually, uh, this uh, is a very good uh, segue to have then Bob uh, speaking about the technicalities of 5G. Just one sec before you start, Bob, I, I think it's also uh, very good to add another element of clarification. We are all speaking about 5G as if it was something uh, very easy uh, to make it to make happen uh, as if it was a simple software update it is not uh, 5g actually uh, demands enormous uh, network investment in fiber in macro micro and small cells spectrum auctions and that is the reason why real 5g so far exists only in china south korea and a little bit actually, in the no US. place so please go, okay. i don't want to steal uh, your so your time get Bob, to my slides uh since i've got a little a uh, short amount of time i'll skip ahead to the main point which is the primary purpose of 5g is to kill the internet by making claims that it's about money and economics. Uh, I'll get to that in detail. And that the use cases you go into don't make sense. One obvious problem, getting ahead of my slides, is it's only cellular. All the land connection stuff, the stories just don't fit together. So let me uh, start with the green button to move ahead, I guess. So the first thing we have to understand is what is the internet? There is no physical thing called the internet. The internet is a technique we use to repurpose any available technology in order to basically provide connectivity between endpoints. So it started out by buying telco wires and repurposing those. And it's the technique, so it doesn't make sense to compete with the internet. In order to provide these services, you have to take facilities off the table and make them unavailable. Um, you know, and you have to claim we need pipes, or re re uh, and I'll get to the pipe story in, in a little while. Uh, the real importance of the end, and this is what's very hard to understand, is the strict decoupling between what we do in the applications and the packets we exchange. And that means, economically, there's no provenance or way to pay for each individual packet, which is why voice over IP was such a surprise, because there was no economic way to pay for that capacity. It happened by accident, it was discovered when there was enough capacity to do the web, 
and that generated as a byproduct package. It even surprised the people doing voice over IP that worked over the general internet. So it goes against the economic model in the stories. Um, now, I've got a bad habit. This is an American thing about you're not supposed to look a gift horse in the mouth because it's a gift. So 5G claims to be a gift. I have a bad habit of looking at it in detail and asking, does it make sense? So the real purpose is to claw the value back into the network. So the voice calls are made in these devices. It's just an app now. Now, in 1870, you needed a special network to create two endpoints because they were dumb, and you need a reserve pipe between the two endpoints in order to keep the signal intact. That's a design point of telecommunications because it's like railroads. You own, you try to sell voice services as a service and you pay for the infrastructure as a cost center. Uh, and that's, even when it went digital, the first uh, stage in new technology is emulation. So the intelligent network of the 1970s was designed to get a reserve path from two points in order to guarantee low latency. Because we can prove scientifically without any doubt whatsoever that you needed that in order to do voice. We can play, Claude Shannon showed this. There was no question we need a special network for voice. This is why voice over IP was such a shock because it turns out you don't need low latency for that. The market just worked its way around and voice worked well without any promises in the network. Not only did voice work well, it worked better because in order to provide that fixed pipe, they needed to set, fix the capacity and make the guarantees and charge for it. By using commodity bits, we we're able to do voice at no additional cost. Not only that, we we're able to do video at no additional cost. That's the amazing thing because for almost half a century, the phone company tried to make a business of video and failed because they had to charge extra for the video capacity and make a promise. Once we accepted the possibility that video might fail and that we didn't need to guarantee low the network, suddenly video becomes something casual. We're Zooming connected to this, people in the world at no extra cost. That's amazing. 5G is an attempt to uh, deal with that problem because the problem is there is no revenue going back to the phone company, to the network, to pay for the infrastructure if they're not getting any of the value created in applications. So they have to make up a story about how you need to bring that pipe back, low latency. And they have to come, what application needs low latency? Remote video reality. Now, how many people think there's a national, international crisis that the most important thing we have to do to spend billions of dollars to do remote uh, gaming? You know, that, that's the best they can do, and only if you do it without a wire, and only if you need the right transmitter. You can't extend it, you can't do a wire. This story doesn't make sense. The other story is IoT. Connect all the devices. Well, that doesn't make sense either, because I can just get a Wi-Fi thing, connect as many devices I need more, connect it. If I own the radios, I can get as many devices as I want connected, but if you, want to, if you hire a really bad engineer, let's say bring it all back to the center and send it out again. It's like you want to visit your neighbor, you gotta go downtown. The idea of fixed pipes creates scarcity because you gotta take capacity off the table. How many of you remember the busy signal? You call somebody, you get a busy signal. You know, they wanna bring back the busy signal, which is an, an artifact of having to reserve capacity. Um, and people have died because they couldn't make a cellular call and they couldn't get a lower quality because they had to get the network service. Uh, we have lions in the Serengeti who attract because they can afford a cellular account, um, but the cows can't, so you cannot track the cows. If the farmers owned the radios as a local facility, there'd be no problem. So we have to evolve beyond the business model of tele telecommunications because it's no longer viable. If we create applications in here, we're no longer paying for the network when we make a voice call. So look at the road analogy. So we pay for road, your local city will pay for your local roads. You pay for it out of local taxes. Uh, we, when you get a, make 
a, a route using a mapping program, none of the money for the route goes to the road owner. So we have a business model of having roads as infrastructure paid for by local communities and applications like driving and, and uh, mapping that basically are independent of that. They use the infrastructure. Like when you go to the grocery, you, you don't have to pay every time the road owner, every time you pay the road. It's a common shared facility. And that's a very powerful model and it creates abundance. So in the 5G model, you have reserved pipes for these applications. It's like having a reserved lane on the road. Before you get on the road, you have to reserve a lane. If you can tolerate traffic jams, you suddenly get huge capacity on the roads. If we, so there is an alternative to telecommunications, an alternative to 5G, which is I call the national packet infrastructure. If you just provide open packet connectivity everywhere, suddenly you get abundant capacity, the IoT things work, all these applications start working. Yes, you might not be able to uh, do remote surgery, which is also called murder, because the problem with, the, with depending on the network for things like low latency is you're fatally dependent, in this case, literally fatally dependent, because if anything goes wrong with the network, your application fails. So if you're doing an application, you would be a fool to depend on 5G, because it only work where all the 5G transmitters, which by the way, are very problematic transmitters, very limited range. If it doesn't, if you're in the basement, you're not connected. It's a very bad design. Now, I can understand why engineers are excited about the 5G radios, but just like in the 1960s, sugar companies paid research to show fat was bad, uh, the engineers who are excited about 5G radios, uh, basically their engineering is used to, to support the story because low latency you get in one radio requires a complete different business model to extend to the network. But having a packet infrastructure means you can get connected devices at work. Because a device, the problem, one problem with 5G for connected devices, you need a billing relationship for every device. And that means it's a fatal point of failure. If you had national packet infrastructure that, and a way of paying for the infrastructure is a common good, like roads, then you can freely connect devices without a problem. So 5G is basically an attempt to bring back the 1970s network, a failed idea uh, because it basically of economics. And we have alternatives which generate uh, basically abundant capacity and prosperity and are inherently neutral because packets are indifferent to the content. And inherent neutrality is better than trying to oppose neutrality with hyper complex rules that can be gamed. Sorry, sorry to speak so fast, no but problem. we're out of time. Uh, I guess there are uh, comments or uh, questions about this last point on uh, 5G. Uh, do we, do, is there any comments in the room? Otherwise, I have one. Now, in line of what I was uh, mentioning before, uh, I think there is one has to distinguish between marketing and reality. Uh, so again, the fact that in many countries, 5G is not really even anymore marketed as 5G, but 4.5G, which is a simple upgrade of yes. LTE technology, uh, which actually, when it is in the latest evolution, has more or less the same uh, latency and bandwidth capacity as uh, 5G may uh, offer for uh, consumers. This means that actually 5G is very, the reality of 5G is very far from the marketing. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, one may start, therefore, to wonder if 5G uh, concretely may not be used uh, as, a, let's say, a Trojan horse to start to uh, ask for concessions from regulators mm -hmm. uh, and to, yeah, f for, to, for a more flexible regulatory environment, uh, rather than uh, doing the work as operators in investing in network and not trying to create new, new business models which actually are extractivists. Uh, so the, uh, my question is uh, for the, my august uh, panelists, but also for the room, uh, if you have in your countries uh, ever found a, uh, uh, not an operator, but a device producer 
an IoT system producer or uh, a, a private sector representative, which is not a telecom operator, uh, asking to regulators to have uh, special 5G provisions or telling them that the current regulatory framework is not good and they cannot develop their own 5G uh, networks. So my question is, besides operators asking for upgrade or special uh, uh, provisions to allow for 5G uh, from regulators, is there, on the other hand, uh, any IoT produ uh, system producer, any connected device system producer, any virtual reality uh, service provider that is asking for special 5G uh, compliant provisions. I see silence, but uh, I the printers like it because you produce a lot of labels that say 5G. I think I think silence is the point yeah. that there are really no killer apps that uh, uh, that have uh, justified the demand for mm -hmm. uh, such bandwidth yet. But just just uh, I think we are uh, going out of time. But uh, just my intervention is 5G should be separated from network slicing. Mm -hmm. um, what uh, we were, I mean, what we talked about negatively is uh, network slicing, mm -hmm. where you slice the bandwidth and sell it to slice at a higher price. Mm -hmm. uh, there you, you are disconnecting a package, you are setting conditions for uh, delivering package. Uh, but 5G is possible without network slicing. Now, whether without being able to sell those uh, highly priced slices to the, the killer app providers that don't exist yet, uh, whether, it make, whether it makes economic sense to be able to uh, build, uh, build out the network uh, without, without selling those premium slices, I don't know because I'm not the economist. Yep. Uh, but, uh, uh, but theoretically, 5G can exist without network slicing. What, what is 5G? That, 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 that we have. What do you mean by 5G? Uh, well, using higher frequency uh, electromagnetic waves, so, uh, about so, 20 times higher than... So, sorry, let me restore years. discipline yeah. for yeah. one second. Okay. <laughs> and uh, uh, Frode was in line to speak and to provide the last word because I see that we have to leave the room. So I would, uh, I, I would ask the regulator to uh, uh, wrap up the debate and provide the rest uh, comments on 5G. Yeah, I'll try. Uh, I think there, we actually had two different discussions about 5G and net neutrality in the panel. Uh, we, we had the, the intervention from uh, Bob Frankson, which, which was very interesting, of course. And uh, your intervention was more about, do we need 5G? Uh, does it provide anything else than internet access? Um, and that is, uh, one side, uh, or, uh, one, one, one side uh, of the discussion. The other side from the operators, um, we will hear from them some other day, I guess. Uh, they could say, we really need 5G because it's innovative and provides services in different ways than the internet. So that, that is for the future to prove what, who is right in that discussion. I don't take a side in that discussion. The other discussion we had in the panel, uh, presented by, by the French and the Norwegian regulators, is more the practical discussion. Does net neutrality regulation provide any um, obstacle to 5G development? And that was, was what I tried to present in my, my intervention, that uh, net neutrality in, in Europe at least and in many other regulations is compatible with 5G. And then it's for the market to show with what kind of services we will have on, on the 5G network in the future, in the near future, hopefully. Thank you very much, Frode. And actually, uh, and this uh, optimist view that net neutrality is indeed compatible with 5G, but I think that more uh, work is up to us to do. Perhaps uh, uh, from here until next year's session, we may also start some specific work on 5G and net neutrality, which seems to be uh, something quite intriguing and interesting uh, to, to, be, to be studied. Now, let me thank everyone here, both the panelists and uh, uh, the participants for the very good input and excellent discussion. Uh, of course, more discussion uh, will be more uh, needed and helpful, so uh, I 
Yeah, I, I, I already mentioned the map, uh, Chris, but I will mention it again. Uh, so do not forget to check the zerating.info uh, website, where there is also uh, not only a lot of interesting information about zero rating, but also a map uh, uh, organized by country and by continents now of zero rating applications, regulations, and net neutrality regulations. Thank you very much, and see you next year. Thank you.